welcome to Global Connection here on Think Tech's live streaming network. I'm your host, Grace Chang, here today to talk with Dr. Stieg Jarl Hansen, who is currently at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And we'll be talking about jihadists in Africa, um, including the Islamic State and the situation there in Africa as far as how they're faring, whether they are gaining ground, losing ground. So I'd like to welcome Stieg to to our program, and he's coming us live remote from, from Harvard. Hi, Stieg. Thank you very much for uh, having me, Grace. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm really excited to talk to you about this topic because, you know, since, since 1998, right, the U.S. embassies were hit in Kenya and in Tanzania, and, you know, uh, I know that the situation has been ongoing. We don't get a lot of press on, on this topic, I think, in the U.S. media, um, but we know especially in the recent years, Boko Haram's kidnappings, um, some of the bombing in the, the uh, shopping malls. And um, earlier this year, the head of uh, U.S. Africa Command said that the Islamic State was doubling its forces in Libya. So I think it's, it's kind of a, it seems like it's a pressing topic, but we hear a lot of conflicting things, whether they're gaining ground or losing ground um, in, in, in the continent. So. You are an expert in the field, and so very happy to have you here to talk about this topic. Um, so could you first tell us a little bit about yourself and your background here? No, I uh, have uh, conduct conducted a lot of field studies in um, the Africa, and especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I traveled to uh, Somalia from 2004 and onwards. I have been uh, annually in Mogadishu, uh, with the exception of 2013 and 2014. Uh, I also was a part of a British military mission to uh, Nigeria, so I had the opportunity to study Nigeria a little bit more closely, and I'm currently involved in a larger uh, jihadi war economy project studying uh, Africa, but also the Levant. So I've worked with this a lot of uh, years, and I talked to several of the leaders, especially in the Shabab, uh, which at times were a little bit challenging, uh, both methodologically, but also uh, security-wise. But uh, I'm here, uh, and perhaps uh, most known for my work on the Harakat al-Shabaab, the radical group in, in Somalia. Yes, yes, and, and you wrote the book uh, uh, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, right? The history and ideology of uh, an Islamic group there. Yes, and, uh, and uh, it received quite good uh, feedback. It was reviewed in uh, The Economist and the Foreign Policy and received uh, very good feedback. So currently, what would you say the situation is, um, and perhaps giving us a little bit of background, going back to maybe the 90s, as I was talking about the U.S. Embassy attacks. Yes, what you can see is you have several phases of uh, violent jihadism in Africa. Uh, violent jihadism meaning that you want to use uh, violence to promote what you see is the religious, uh, religious values, basically. So you have the 90s, where you had this uh, period when Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda established themselves in Sudan from 1991 to 1996, uh, trying to support several smaller religious uh, organizations in that, uh, at that stage. But these smaller organizations, they were very fragmented, so Al-Qaeda wasn't really a big success. Uh, Al-Qaeda was also following them, the Sudanese foreign policy, so to a certain extent it was kind of a a puppet or a tool that Sudan used to further its uh, foreign policy goals. So you had a close relationship between Sudan and Al-Qaeda in that period. But in 1996, Osama bin Laden moved away. Uh, and uh, what remained in Africa uh, since he fell out with the Sudanese authorities was more or less small networks. And th these networks, they were based in East Africa, and th those networks were really hitting them, the uh, embassies in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. Um, but this changed rapidly after September 11. Suddenly, a lot of uh, movements in Africa exploded. Jihadi, uh, violent jihadi organizations increased in size and in numbers. So you will f suddenly have the uh, Boko Haram emerging in 2003. The interesting thing with the Boko Haram was that from 2003 to 2009, it was actually legal. And in some cases, even supported by the regional authorities inside the province, the Borno province, when they were active. So they had some support from the Nigerian government, which is very interesting. They were tolerated and sometimes supported uh, to be used for political purposes. At the same time, on the other end of the continent, you had the Shabab, you know, created in its first, uh, first, uh, 
first uh, stages in 2003-2004 in Somalia as a small network, but then riding piggyback on the Sharia courts of Mogadishu in 2006, and starting up uh, really in uh, 2007 as a clearly independent movement. It further uh, north in the west, you had the, also several movements in, in Mali. Uh, you have the Ansardin and the Mujau, who also had some connections to Al-Qaeda. And you had the local organization in Algeria who changed their name to Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. So you had this period from 2000 uh, to maybe 2012, where you had a really, uh, a really expansion of these organizations in sub-Saharan Africa a large expansion, and at the end of that period, a lot of these organizations strengthened their connection with Al-Qaeda. So in 2012, Shabab will say that they are part of Al-Qaeda. In the case of Mali, the Ansar Din, they will have a leader that more or less married a daughter of one of the Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb leaders. So he got the kind of connection with the Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Mujau, they had a no infamous leader, Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar, who was behind the Inamenas attack, the attack against the oil facility in uh, Algeria in 2013. Uh, they called him the one-eyed guy. And he also had strong Al-Qaeda connections. So you had this phase with a lot of, uh, first, a lot of jihadi organizations emerging. Then secondly, several of these organizations affiliating themselves with Al-Qaeda. It doesn't mean that they were directly controlled by Al-Qaeda, but they swore oath or they had close connections with Al-Qaeda. So exactly how well they were centrally controlled, it's really hard to say. But Al-Qaeda, we have to say an insight, was kind of successful in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, unfortunately for Al-Qaeda, then you had the Islamic State. So the Islamic State started to emerge and started to separate itself from Al-Qaeda. So we will have 2011, 2012, 2013, where the Islamic State is consolidating in the Levant and it's more or less breaking contact with Al-Qaeda, declaring themselves uh, as a separate organization. At the start, they were a part of the Al-Qaeda network, but they became separate and then declaring this caliphate and taking large territorial holdings in, um, in the Syria and Iraq. <coughs> what this did was basically uh, first to turn away some of the foreign recruitment, for example, to Shebab. So in the United States, you had a recruitment uh, channel going out from Minnesota, first to the Shebab, and this recruitment channel was more or less turned towards the Islamic State. So the so ethnic Somalis in Minnesota that previously were uh, radical, they uh, went to Somalia, but suddenly they started to go to Syria. So it was a loss for the Shebab. <coughs> in addition to that, they started to woo several organizations in Africa. First, Boko Haram, Boko Haram in the end, the leader of uh, Boko Haram in the end, swearing al allegiance to the Islamic State. So the Boko Haram then became a part of the Islamic State. Again, it's hard to say how directly controlled it was. Mm -hmm. uh, Boko Haram was then used in relation to the Shebab. So the Islamic State produced propaganda videos featuring Boko Haram leaders and Boko Haram activists to ask the Shebab to join the Islamic State. But the Shebab never joined the Islamic State. Uh, further north, uh, Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar's group in Mali, they had a sub-commander who swore allegiance on behalf of his organization to the Islamic State. So suddenly you saw the Sheba were challenged by the Islamic State. Boko Haram seemed to be in an alliance with the Islamic State. Um, the remains of Mujau seemed to be also having at least one leader who swore an oath to the Islamic State. So suddenly you had a wave of Islamic State coming into sub-Saharan Africa. Right, right. I mean, this seems to be, I'm sorry to cut you off, but um, this seems to be kind of the, the, the what we're seeing is that Al-Qaeda seems to have some preeminence among jihadi groups, but now, now we have Islamic State here uh, with many groups kind of pledging the allegiance, including maybe slip splintering off from existing groups, like from Al-Shabaab forming new groups that declare allegiance. Um, we're seeing this kind of competition. Could you talk? We have a, a couple minutes for a break. Maybe give us a little more of what you were trying to say, uh, continuing with that. Yes, absolutely. Because what we see now is uh, that uh, Al-Qaeda has stroken back. So you can see that Al-Qaeda is actually gaining back on the various uh, uh, Islamic State attempts. What happened in Somalia, if I can start with that, is basically the intelligence services of the Shabab, the Amniyad, 
they hit heavily back at Islamic State sympathizers within that organization. So a lot of them were killed, uh, a lot of them were captured, <coughs> and the groups that remained free inside the Sheb uh, inside the Shebab areas were on the periphery of the Shebab. So there was a large group to the north led by a guy called Sheikh Mumin, and a large group to the south who was led originally by a German foreign fighter called Müller uh, that remained separate. <coughs> but it's important to understand that these groups are relatively small. Mm -hmm. So a couple of, um, uh, one month ago in October, this group uh, in the north of Somalia captured a small uh, city called Kandela. <coughs> and it was really uh, depicted on the CNN as the Islamic State uh, gaining a foothold in Africa. Mm -hmm. What it was, was really this, this city was a pirate city before. It didn't have a mm -hmm. police force. <coughs> so the Islamic State, they basically went in and took a city that wasn't really controlled by anybody. So mm -hmm. it was an easy military operation. Yeah. The closest garrison of the local uh, authorities was 13 hours away. And then the Islamic State militia under Mumin, they withdrew. So it was a propaganda show. It didn't really show strength. Yeah. Uh, the propaganda videos from these groups mm -hmm. shows very few soldiers. Mm -hmm. And the German fighter that uh, appeared on the start, uh, Müller, that appeared on the start of these videos of the Is Islamic State group in the south, he was actually killed. So he died. And uh, the northern leader, Sheikh Mumin, he was um, in hiding in the mountains. Mm -hmm. So really what happened here was not that impressive. And what's interesting for the Sheba was that their Kenyan affiliates, Tanzanian affiliates, al Hijira. They declared clear loyalty to Al Qaeda and to the Shabab. So, what happened in the case of the Shabab was only small, small groups, peripheral. The Shabab kept control over their own forces and they remained in solid relationships to Al Qaeda. What happened in the Boko Haram was actually, it seems like the Islamic State weakened Boko Haram very seriously. You know, Boko Haram took some hits because of a, a new military offensive from the neighboring countries involving Shadian forces involving Nigerian forces uh, that defeated them a lot in the battlefield. But in addition to this, the son of the founder of Boko Haram, he declares himself the new leader of what they call the Western, uh, pro, uh, the West African province of mm. the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. And the old leader, the infamous Abu Bukha Shakao, uh, said that this was wrong, that uh, al-Baghdadi and the Islamic States, they uh, outsold him. They tried to take control over his organization and that this could, uh, would lead to a fight and he will uh, be prepared to maintain control over the organization. Okay, so yeah. the split in Boko Haram, it's split into two and mm -hmm. for now it seems like the old part, the Abu Bukhar uh, Shakao part, actually is the most powerful and they now have declared themselves against Baghdadi. Uh -huh. Okay, um, that, that's really interesting. So it's, it's really not it's causing a bit of a split and let's talk about this a little bit more after we come back from this one minute break thank you for that great background and overview of the all of the groups throughout the continent um, we'll come back in a minute and and talk more with Steve Hansen about jihadis in Africa stay tuned hello I'm Marianne Sasaki welcome to Think Tech Hawaii where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with Think Tech Hawaii, and I'd like to ask you to come watch my show, The Economy in You, each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. We live stream every Tuesday from noon to 1230. And you get a chance to hear what people are doing about sustainability in Hawaii and what the issues are impacting all of us in all the islands. Join us, please. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, here talking with Steve Hansen of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And we're talking about 
the Islamic State and its situation in Africa uh, as far as what, what the, whether it's gaining ground, losing ground, and also covering you know, this, this recent history of the jihadi movements in, on the continent. Welcome back, Stig. Thank you. Hey, as you were saying, I mean, you gave us a great overview about all of these different movements that have kind of sprouted out um, in many situations. I mean, you suggested in, in Somalia, uh, one of the, the, the areas that Islamic State had captured was really just part of a, you know, one of the areas where the, the collapsed state of Somalia was not able to govern at all. So, I mean, many, you know, we have many different reports in the in, in sense of like, you know, it, it seems that a lot of these incidents are very sensationalized. So we have a big kind of sense that, that uh, these groups are really gaining ground and expanding. Um, I think earlier this year, the Senate had heard um, some testimony that there are more deaths from this kind of violence in Africa than in the Middle East. Um, but there are other sources that say that, yeah, a lot of these groups are losing ground. And as you were talking about before the break, um, this introduction of the rivalry between Al Qaeda and, and Islamic State has kind of uh, weakened groups, splintered them, and caused some internal rifts. Yeah. I think uh, that's that's what's fascinating with the Islamic State. You know, I won't say that they made a large inroad into Africa. In the case of Mali, uh, where you had Mujahu entering into an alliance and creating an other organization called Les Mirabutu, and in the case of Sheba, they captured small, small groups that in reality are insignificant. Although some of the media tried to make them significant, like. CNN talking a lot about the conquest of uh, Candela uh, by what they saw as the Islamic State. It's a small group. If you look into their videos, sometimes it's rather pathetic, I tell you, because they will circulate the same troops over and over again to appear quite big. So you had these incidences in Mali where at best the Islamic State made small groups. And what they did in Nigeria was actually to split one of the most dangerous groups in Africa. You know, we haven't really seen the results. I think Abu Bukar Shekau will get on, uh, Abu Kur Shekau will get on the top of things. He will control uh, Boko Haram, the major part of Boko Haram, because Boko Haram had split before and he ended up on the top of it at that stage also. But his rival now is the son of the founder. It's uh, Barnawi who is the son of the founder. So this is going to be exciting to see. But what we see is a block of the Islamic State. You know, the Islamic State tried very hard. What they managed to do was to split up a large organization. Otherwise, it was rather peripheral. And when it comes to your second question, what is really the status of those movements now? If you look at Somalia, Shebab is actually quite stable. Uh, Shebab holds some territories. There's very bad security in the countryside, so they can survive behind enemy lines because basically villages are not properly secured by the Af forces of the African Union. So they can go into villages, steal money, uh, local villages, marrying off their daughters to the Sheba because they want to be safe. Uh, they can for recruit people in these villages and then the Amazon will come there once a week, but Sheba will have a presence uh, six days a week and run away when the Amazon mm -hmm. comes and they will come back. So in one sense, they are ruling those cities anyway. So Shebab is stable and they are, have their eyes on Kenya, they have their eyes on Tanzania. In Kenya, the police have cracked down really efficiently at, at the Shebab structures. So it's little recruitment going into Somalia, but there are active Shebab cells inside Kenya. And the root causes, the animosity towards the state in Kenya is not fixed. Inside Tanzania, it's a big question mark because uh, there has been networks inside Tanzania there have been a small group inside Tanzania who declared a kind of uh, uh, oath towards, uh, towards uh, the, the Islamic State, but it's very unclear what they really wanted. So there's something going on in Tanzania, and Tanzania is not really prepared for it. But, mm. but it's not something stra uh, really heavy. They had an attack against the police station last year. It was very bloody. It seems like the people involved in that attack was, uh, was taken out. Uh, in Nigeria, Nigeria, Boko Haram has faced a lot of problems. They have a northern Nigerian as the president, Buhari, and Buhari has transferred a lot of the military units into the north. You know, the Nigerians are weak because they get most of their income from the oil in the south, so they need military units in the south. Mm -hmm. But the northern president, Buhari, has taken a lot of chances and he's transferred army units to the north. In addition to that, one of Africa's most efficient armies, the Shadian army, has intervened directly helping Nigeria, which is a kind of 
a little mm. embarrassing for Nigeria, uh -huh. strong man of Africa, and then it cannot help itself. Uh, the way Boko Haram seem to have dealt with this is to pull back in face of uh, superior forces, but also it seems like they have become more active in Niger. Niger mm. before has been really calm when it comes to his uh, violent jihadists, right, but right. Uh, they are weak when it comes to their forces. They have been lenient on Boko Haram networks. Uh, Boko Haram have uh, several Boko Haram members have tribal networks in that state, but it seemed to have been more active. In Mali, after the uh, French intervention, uh, the Islamist organizations withdraw and they reorganize, and they are still active. They are far from defeated, and they can hide out in the large ways of the Saharan Desert. So there is really hard. Uh, it's really hard to defeat them. So what you can say is that. For Mali and uh, the northern part of West Africa and Somalia, it's more or less a stable situation where these violent jihadist organizations still are powerful, but they are stable. They are not expanding. They're slightly on the defensive, but they will survive. In Nigeria, it's uh, a little bit more complicated. You know, they are split into two, as I said. They have major Nigerian army units fighting them. They have Chadian units fighting them. But I also dealt with Boko Haram before, and they had similar crises. They had the first crisis when they became uh, uh, they, they became illegal in 2009 where they for the first time were banned by the Nigerian authorities there was a big crackdown the first leader Yusuf was killed by the police uh, they had the second crisis in 2013 when the Nigerian army organized an entirely new division and sent it north north and now they have another crisis but all the time they managed to survive um, so, so I mean, that I think that's kind of interesting because I think we hear a great deal about Boko Haram because of the, the kidnappings of the schoolgirls and some of these other uh, really dramatic, well, it's played up in the, in the media is quite dramatically, but that they were once a legal organization and, and then declared illegal. How, how are they different um, when they were legal? Did they really substantively change um, in terms of their, their objectives or was it their actions that, that made them decla be declared legal by the state? I tell you what, Grace, this is a very strange story. Uh, you know, uh, Boko Haram in its legal phase was used by political parties in Borno as a kind of political stormtroopers. Uh -huh. They had a lot of influence at times in, uh, in regional politics to the extent that they were a part of the governmental apparatus that decided who could go to Saudi Arabia for pilgrimage or not. So they were relatively involved in politics. Uh, they had quite extreme opinions also at that stage, but they didn't attack churches, etc., etc. They were more involved in, in the political showdowns. What happened was in 2009, there are several sources. Some of the sources will say that the Boko Haram really planned to go violent, so they were um, gathering arms and preparing to go violent. Other sources say that this was actually a car accident. Uh, where there was an accident, uh, there were a, a, a Boko Haram member who drive, uh, several Boko Haram members who drove without helmets, and they were, uh, the police wanted to capture them, and then everything escalated. So it was a big showdown in 2009 between them and the police, but certainly they became more violent after this uh, showdown. So the violence escalated, but you don't know if these radical trends before the showdown would have escalated as well. Yeah. Uh, and that we would have seen a more violent Boko Haram uh, anyway, but it would have taken more time at least. I think that's fair to say. And what's very important with Boko Haram, never before declaring allegiance with the Islamic State, did they declare allegiance to Al-Qaeda. In fact, they never declared allegiance to Al-Qaeda. Shebab declared allegiance to Al-Qaeda. Hijira in Kenya declared allegiance to Al-Qaeda. And in Mali, Ansardin and Mujawu that we talked about had strong connections to Al-Qaeda. They didn't mm -hmm. declare allegiance either until quite recently okay. when uh, parts of Mujawu did this. But, but in the old days, they had strong connections. Mm -hmm. uh, they had members from Al-Qaeda in their ranks. They had, as I said, in Ansardin, one of the leaders married into Al-Qaeda, basically. Okay. And, and so you, I mean, you've, you've given us a list of many different groups that you've been talking about. I mean, as far as their strength, there's, there's, there's so many of them, so it does sound very alarming. And then we hear the affiliations being declared with Islamic State and, and some groups declaring we are Islamic State of, you know, this particular region of Greater Sahara, for example. Um, but, you know, how, how significant are these groups? Are these, you know, you said some of them are very, very pitifully small. Um, others, are they more significant? I mean, even if they're stable. Um, do they constitute a major threat to the security in, in the region? 
I, I would say that um, if we start in the East, uh, the threat from the Shebab against the United States, you know, has become less because before they recruited a lot in the United States, but they haven't managed. No, it's the Islamic State that they started to recruiting, and no, even the Islamic State is declining. Uh, so in one sense, their recruitment potential in the uh, U.S. were stolen away by the Islamic State. But mind you, and several of their videos, they have listed potentially American targets and uh, said that uh, if you cannot come to Somalia, you hit in the United States. So they are encouraging attacks mm -hmm. inside the United States. But I don't think they will plan attacks in the United States. I think their focus is regional and they always did that. They always hit regional ta targets and they prefer to hit ta uh, targets in the countries that are involved in the African Union inside Somalia. So, But mind you, when they do this, that's tourist targets as well, and they might hit Westerners when they attack those tourist targets. And there might be a likelihood that Al-Qaeda centrally or other Al-Qaeda affiliates can take advantage of Shebab infrastructure if they, mm. they plan larger attacks, including Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula is rather close to the Shebab. Okay. If you go to the West, if you go to, to, to uh, Boko Haram, Boko Haram has even been more reg reg uh, locally focused than, than uh, Shebab. So they've been focused on mainly on one province inside Nigeria, historically. But for the last three years, you saw that they had some interest in Cameroon. And as I said, they moved into uh, Niger to mm -hmm. try to uh, implement terrorist attacks in Niger, but also as a safe zone, basically. Mm -hmm. And Cameroon is rather, rather weak militarily. I don't see Boko Haram attacking internationally at all. You know, I don't think okay. that they are very interested in mm -hmm. it. But I do see them attacking, staging terrorist attacks in larger cities inside Nigeria okay. and Niger as well. Wow. What wow. you see in Mali, it's slightly more uh, serious. And uh, I think uh, in Amena shows that, you know, if you go a little bit further north from Mali, you will have oil installations operated by Western uh, yeah, oil Yeah, because of the location. Wow, Steek, so we have about a couple seconds left. So I, I'm sorry we don't have more time, Never, not enough time for this. This is a very big topic and, and really appreciate you sharing your expertise on all of these groups. would love to have you back and talk in more depth. I think we talked a lot in depth already, but there, there's obviously there's so much more, but it seems like yeah, a lot of the groups are, are not as significant as far as the scope of their reach and, and, and uh, impact as, as we might see it. So thank you so much. I'm here with Steve Hansen of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And you're what, you've been watching Global Connections, and I'm your host, Grace Chang. See me here next Thursday, or actually next Thursday is Thanksgiving, and other Thursdays at 1 p.m. Uh, thank you so much again, Steve. Thank Aloha. you. Yeah, that's great.